Hello? Ah. 안녕하세요. Hello. I'm David Sachs, a journalist and writer and author of the book The Revenge of Analog, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, the Revenge of Analog is something that is a phenomenon that I sort of observed and describe in the book. And it's really happened over the past decade or so, since the invention of the smartphone. In an era over the past you know, 12 or 15 years, when we assume that digital technology, right, the technology of ones and zeros of smartphones, of Apple, of Samsung, would take over completely and make irrelevant all the analog, non-digital technologies, all the goods and services that had existed in the economy in the world before, right? Books and bookstores, retail stores, um, you know, paper, you name it, that there was this assumption that once digital came out, once there was sort of an equivalent in a software or hardware, then that analog thing would die. It would, it would be thrown to the dust heap. And what I started seeing 10 years ago and really started growing since was that the opposite was happening. There was this interesting period of adoption and then all of a sudden you saw analog goods and analog services growing again and making a comeback. You saw the rise of vinyl records and book publishing and brick and mortar bookstores and then retail stores where companies like Amazon started opening up their own stores when you know their entire purpose was to put them out of business. Um, you saw it sort of not just in, in, in North America and Korea, but all over the world. And it was this phenomenon that nobody really understood why it was happening. It, it sort of flew contrary to our belief and idea of how technological progress works, right? Why is the revenge of analog happening? I'm going to tell you the first reason of why not, because this is the assumption. And it's the assumption by people who come from a different generation. There's this assumption that it's just nostalgia, that it's people who are in their 50s and 60s, they, they just want to cling to the old ways of doing things they don't want to change. But the reality is in every one of those categories, in every area that I've seen, whether it's music or books or retailing, the drivers of analog's renewed growth over the past decade have been those young people, people who are in their 30s and their 20s and even their teens. They're the ones who are actually going out and asking for this older technology, spending their money on it. Their consumer habits are the ones that are driving it. Um, and so it, it's, it's something new almost. And, and I break it down into two reasons of why that is, okay? The head and the heart. So let's start up top with the head. The head are all the logical reasons why analog makes sense, right? Analog is is a set of tools. It's a technology. All the, the analog technologies, whether we're talking about film or records or paper, are a tool that is different and distinct from the tools of digital technology, of software, of hardware, of tablets, of phones, whatever. And so when you think about the tool, it provides a different way of doing things. And that different process drives a different result. One of the ones that I was really surprised and amazed to see so prevalent here in Seoul last time I came was paper. Papers is incredible and it, it's a tool. When you go to a Hanji store, there's paper notebooks, paper planners, and this is something that's grown around the world. The, the revolution of smartphones has actually been sort of alongside the revolution of this new wave of paper notebooks. Companies like Moleskin or here, I think it's um, Indigo, have made notebooks sort of the, the accessory for innovation. So if you go to a WeWork or you go to a Samsung office or you go to any technology company, someone's sitting there writing on their, their MacBook or their Samsung Tablet X or whatever it's called, they have their smartphone and then they're writing in the notebook as well. So why is that? What is it about it that makes it such a strong tool for innovation even when people can use tablets, electronic pens, you know, laptops, whatever. I, I found the answer in, of all places, Silicon Valley, the heart of sort of the digital economy. Let's say you have a brilliant new idea for the way that the Gmail inbox should look or what a new email should look like. And you're in the elevator one day at Google headquarters and in walks Sergey Brin, the founder of the company. You have 30 seconds to communicate this idea to Sergey. And if he likes it and changes it, you know, he's just going to give you a billion dollars and your life is set. That's how it works in Silicon Valley. So I've been told. 
Are you gonna pull out your laptop and open it up and turn it on and open up a new document and format that document and then pull out your pen and oh no, the Bluetooth connection isn't working. Oh no, the Wi-Fi is not working. Boom, elevator opens. There goes your billion dollars and you're back to just making, I don't know, $500,000. Um, or are you gonna pull out a pen from your pocket and you know, draw it on your hand and voila, right? Paper, pen is a simple technology. It's limited in the size of the page, but what you can do in that is instantaneous, which is why so many of you are taking notes. You can draw, you can squiggle, you can do lines. It's not perfect, it's not pretty. You can fix that later in the computer or in better drafts, but it's still the best tool for getting ideas out of your head and into the world. But you know, analog in the world we live in, it's not just about the head, it's not about logic, right? It's about the illogical things, the, the heart. Um, does anyone here know Star Trek? Yes, there's a few nerds in here, right? You know, we're, we're not just Dr. Spock, the logical, straight-thinking person. We're, we're Captain Kirk. We're, we're messy. We have emotions. And so what interests me, too, of the reason that's driving sort of the revenge of analog and the return of analog technologies and ideas is these very human, very illogical things, the, 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 the drivers of the heart that, that make us want this stuff. I, I call it, you know, the joy of analog, and it's the joy of two things. One is the joy of things, the joy of stuff. We love stuff. We love things. You walk out into any shopping district in this wonderful city, and someone's selling you all sorts of stuff, mostly skin cream. Um, but, you know, you can get little teddy bears for your cell phone, too. Uh, there's, th it's very human of us to want stuff, and it doesn't make sense, especially certain things like analog goods. I spend, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars a year on books and vinyl records, right? I have a Kindle e-reader. I have Spotify on my phone. I do not need to buy these big chunks of dead trees or these pieces of melted plastic to read and listen to music on it. But I don't care. I love it. I get joy from it. When I went to Korea Books here or uh, a record store in Hyundai last time I was here, you know, that for me was fun. I don't, I don't need to buy Louis Vuitton shoes at the boutique downstairs. I get to know a city and its culture and its people by going to bookstores, by going to record stores. And then I go home and I put these things on my wall and it gives my house sort of a sense of who I am, right? Have you ever been to the apartment of a young person, usually a man who has his first job in finance? and you walk in and it's like a big Samsung television and there's just like soy sauce and beer in the fridge and nothing on the walls, that's not sort of an advanced person living a Zen life, that's, that's kind of sad. It's like a cry for help. We like to walk into places that have possessions and things that show who we are and our personality is. And, and that builds into something that's that, that sort of social element. I went yesterday with Taeyong, my editor, to a little cafe in Mapo, which is a book cafe, which is something that there's, I don't know, dozens of all over Seoul, and I'm sure more around Korea. You don't see them in North America. They're these cafes, bookstores, or just little libraries. And what was amazing is people go there to drink coffee, read books, talk to other people about books. It's not a business. It's not just a place to get a book. It's, it's a sense of community. And in a world where so much of that community is social media and online and what your photo is and you know, doing that, this is a place to actually connect face to face with real people. And that's the deeper value of analog. That's where it really hits in the heart. And I think that's to me what, what brought it back to me of why this book and this topic not only resonated here in South Korea and in Seoul, but was far more advanced than any other country I'd been to and seen in Europe and North America, even in South America, um, far more advanced here. You know, as I said, this is the most advanced civilization, the most advanced country in the world for digital adoption. And I think what you guys have come to understand is that the world isn't black or white. The world isn't digital or analog, Samsung or Apple, one or zero, right? The world is multifaceted. We are not just hurtling into a future where we're just gonna give everything to the computers and be happy. Because we realize that at the end of the day, we're flesh and blood creatures, we're human beings spitting on a planet 
and we're going to relate to the world through the senses that we have, all five senses, the real world that we're in, right? People say, well, it doesn't matter because we're living in a digital world. No, we're living in the real world. The world is analog. Look around you. Touch the person next to you. Shake their hand. You don't have to touch them. Um, this is the world we're in. This is why we come to conferences like this, not just to hear someone like me yak away. You can read the book. It's to meet people. It's to have an experience, have a memory, build relationships, right? That's the essence of who we are. And no matter what technology we have and how good it is, that's, that's what's going to speak to us, whether it's professionally and whether we're trying to sell things to people and, and connect with consumers or whether we're trying to connect with friends and with our family and the greater society around us. And I think that's one of the strengths of South Korea and one of the strengths of Seoul. So when we talk about knowledge and knowledge 5.0 and what's going to happen in the next 100 or 50 years, we talk about the future, we talk about technology. Yes, technology is going to grow. Yes, digital will become a bigger part of our lives. But I think analog will continue to grow with it because we're still going to want to work with our head and our heart, and we're still going to want to interact with the world in a real way. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. The World Knowledge Forum.